Welcome back, fans of German culture. We are back and this time we are analyzing Dies Irai. And just how Nazi is it? At the start there is a Valhalla reference. Hitler really liked Wagner and Wagner used actually a lot of Norse mythology in his pieces. In South Germany, in Bavaria, there's a temple where dead Germans are honored in this temple called Valhalla. This golden structure where Reinhardt is walking along reminds us of the Cologne Cathedral, the Kölner Dom. Just the architecture is what it reminds us of, but maybe it turns out to be something else, just an opinion. Now we see a symbol on the arms where usually the Hakenkreuz is, you know the symbol which Nazi Germany used, the, the Schwarzika. But the symbol it's replaced by we don't know or don't know yet what it refers to. Maybe it's just to avoid controversies. Maybe we know in the future where it comes from, but it's not from actual history. As the interrogation scene starts, there is a date, the 29th of November 1939. Heydrich says that a few days ago there has been an attempt on the Führer's life. Now, in real life, there have been around 40 assassination attempts on Hitler. The example they most likely reference here is Erich Kort's attempt, who tried to blow himself up with Hitler in the Reich Chancellery on November 11th, 1939. So who was Reinhard Heydrich? He was a real person and is often dubbed the architect of the Holocaust. Since Karl Kraft eventually ended up in a concentration camp, this interrogation is quite fitting. Now, what about Heydrich's uniform? You see a skull on his cap, the so-called Totenkopf. It's a symbol for the defiance of death and it was used in German military in the 19th and 20th century. A famous example of it would be Field Marshal August von Mackensen, a hussar. And the version here is more close to the old Brunswick variant, because the skull used by VSS did look a bit different. It was slightly tilted to the side, and the skull itself was much more prominent compared to the crossed bones behind it. The rest of the uniform seems somewhat authentic as well, especially with a huge coat. You gotta know that uh, especially the SS uniforms were designed by Hugo Boss back in the day, and there were countless variants of these uh, long coats, so it's really hard to exactly pinpoint which model this was, but overall it is the same design that was used in general during that time. While you might have heard about Heydrich before, I doubt that most of you have heard about Karl Kraft before, but he too was an actual person back in the day. Full name was Karl Ernst Kraft, and he was a Swiss astrologer, whose family had links to occultism. He predicted that Hitler would be in grave danger from November 7th to November 10th in 1939. And just one day after, as I already told you, Erich Kort made an attempt on Hitler's life. So what's up with all this Nostradamus propaganda business? Well, Karl Kraft was a fierce supporter of National Socialism and his predictions were to be falsified in a way to use them as a psychological weapon in warfare. As in, he sees the future and that makes our enemies powerless before us. Initially, he was interrogated because the Nazis thought he might be a co-conspirator of those failed assassins. The overall obsession with good propaganda has its reason as well. In World War I, Germany surrendered despite being deep within enemy territory and not having a single inch of its own soil occupied by a foreign power. This was in part due to an internal revolution against the monarchy. The narrative later pushed by the National Socialists was that communist Jews agitated the population against those in power. In order to ensure the people wouldn't lose faith mid-war again, and therefore lose the high command for war, they needed good propaganda. This is why the pictures you see 
are World War I pictures. Here we see, for example, a trench with a lot of soldiers, very typical for World War I, and an A7V tank, which was the typical German tank in World War I. Also, you see this machine gun duo with gas masks, and that's based on a famous photo of a British Vickers machine gun crew. The weird circle they show at the end is mainly to showcase Kraft's pseudoscience. If you ever really uh, dug into Nostradamus and how he made his predictions, it wasn't just a guy uh, writing down his dreams or something like this. There is an actual pseudoscience and real calculations behind it all, whether or not you believe that uh, this really tells the truth or not. But um, here we have basically uh, something typical for astrology. You have several circles. The innermost has Roman numerals. The next circle has the planetary symbols. The circle after that, the astrological sign symbols. And the outermost circle showcases the images of those astrological signs, which really fits with all this occult stuff and astrology that Karl Kraft practiced. Oh, the text says dawning days, but a much closer translation would be beginning of a new age, just based on the kanjis, which kind of fits because in 1939 we really got into the hot zone of the Second World War and just based also on what uh, Reinhardt with Mercurius is planning later on, beginning of a new age makes kind of sense. I just found the translation a bit lacking. We get a short scene of people on the streets and I was a little bit disappointed here because people back then wouldn't really look like that, uh, especially not in the 30s. The women somewhat, yes, but for men, these kind of suits, they would be considered uh, rather sloppy. Uh, also, most people would probably wear hats during that period. Uh, this is not only evident due to many photographs, but also due to the fact that a lot of people only washed their hair like once a week back then, because that was considered to be the good thing back in the day, especially for women. So yeah, uh, the men and the women should at least wear hats to make this somewhat more accurate. She's humming Hänschen Klein. I'm not going to explain it again because we already did. A link is in the video. But we didn't tell you that it's not only a story, but it's also kind of a song, a poem. So basically it goes like this. Hänschen Klein ging allein in die weite Welt hinein. Stock und Hut stehen ihm gut, ist gar wohl gemut. As the police arrives, you may or may not have wondered, are these guys really wearing uh, authentic uniforms? Well, I can say yes, they do. Uh, if you especially check the emblem on their hat, for example, and stuff like that, the overall cut and the color, it pretty much matches how the normal police uniform in the Third Reich would have looked like. So props to them, that's some nice attention to detail. So in that short scene, the term Reichsritter is being dropped. What does it mean? Well, originally it was an estate or to say, to put it in simpler terms, a sort of title in the First Reich. Uh, it simply means Knight of the Empire. And uh, you have to know that especially the Nazis and VSS, they had uh, entire castles and uh, basically were LARPing as uh, knights and stuff like that. As weird as it might seem, but uh, that's a thing they were into. But more importantly, what I found interesting during that scene is that the Iron Cross you see on the flag in the background is the modern Bundeswehr variant, the variant used by modern-day German military. In World War II, however, uh, that variant would not have been used. And then the banner on the far left, 
It seems to feature a golden lion, which is a rather common banner animal for Germany, especially in that pose. And I think in this particular case it's the Lion of Palatinate. Eleonore von Wittenburg de Arimas. Onajiku Juni, Beatrice Kirhi Eisen de Arimas. Isumini Stomete Arimas, Isabrena des. Here we see three women of the Schutzstaffel, aka VSS, enter the scene. It's Eleonore von Wittenburg, and she is not a real person. Then there's Beatrice Kircheisen. Also not a real person, although I would not be surprised if this is a slight notch to Kircheis from Legend of the Galactic Heroes, maybe. And then we have Risa Brenner, and I think it's supposed to be Lisa Brenner, but I know the romanization apparently is uses the R and the Z. And uh, I could not find a real person with that name either. There is Eliza Brenner, but she's an American actress of probably Jewish heritage who was just born in the 70s, so I doubt that this is any kind of reference at all. It's worth mentioning that the actual SS did not have female members. There were so-called Aufseherinnen in the concentration camps, so they were basically female SS guards, but uh, they were not SS guards in the sense that they would stand there with a gun, they would just, uh, like a teacher, on, on the schoolyard, they would walk around and tell on some people and stuff like that. They would have a certain say, but uh, they would normally not wield guns, as far as I know. And what I found interesting, however, is that they are dubbed Valkyries. Now, as you probably know, in Norse and Germanic mythology, uh, Valkyries are female warrior spirits who guide fallen warriors to Valhalla. And... The interesting part here is that Richard Wagner, the famous composer, had one of, those, one of his most famous works being called The Ride of the Valkyries. And Hitler was a great fan of Wagner. In fact, Wagner was actually his favorite composer. So it might be a bit of a stretch to draw that connection here, but uh, I think it's, it's kind of nice that they put this little bit of information into the scene. Another name drop. What is Ahnenerbe? Well, literally it means Ancestors' Heritage. And this was an actual organization in the Third Reich, and its task was to archaeologically research the origins of the Aryan race. And to do that they made expeditions all over the world, as far as Tibet and Antarctica. And Basically, this is the origin of this typical trope, you know, from Indiana Jones movies and stuff like that, where the evil Nazis uh, steal treasure from all over the world. This was basically born out of a lot of stuff that Ahnenerbe had a connection towards. Heydrich arrives in a pretty nice Mercedes of a time, which is quite fitting. Uh, this is how most cars looked like in the 1930s. Although, especially here, this is a, a really expensive model that would also often be used by statesmen and, uh, in, in particular, the Nazis, the Nazis, of course. During the fight scene, you see the Valkyries draw their swords. Now, VSS did have swords, the so-called Ehrensäbel, but those were in a curved saber form, not available as a straight sword, as far as I know. The tanks you see in this scene are a perfect fit for the timeline and a great attention to detail. Those are the Panzerkampfwagen 35. Now, these were originally models uh, made by the Czech Skoda. Yes, that's the same Skoda that today uh, manufactures cars. And after the dissolution and annexation of Czechoslovakia in March 1939, Germany basically took all these tanks, because they were better than the tanks that the Germans had at the time. The German tank industry really needed quite a lot of time to produce these really great models that you know from later years of the war. And therefore, for the time, they took the Czech models, because the German tanks at the time they were tanks, all right, but most of them just had machine gun turrets. So you couldn't really fight a war with them. And especially in the early stages of the war, those Czech tanks, they were 
really important and a backbone of a German tank weaponry. Here we see an award ceremony for the Iron Cross. Now pretty much all of you will have definitely seen this uh, in some video game or movie already. And I know that it is rarely really explained, so let me do that for you. First off, a little inaccuracy. The outer rim of a band for this medal should actually be black. Because it was basically displaying the flag colors of the Second and Third Reich, which was black, white and red. Now the Iron Cross itself. It was one of the first European medals awarded in disregard of social and military standing of a recipient and it was first awarded by Prussia during the German liberation wars against Napoleon. Its design is based on the cross of the Teutonic Order, a medieval order of German knights that Christianized the Baltic lands and can be seen in some way as a predecessor to Prussia. It's a very short scene, but here we can see the German Flak, which is, called, which is a short form for Flugabwehrkanone, or simply anti-air cannon. Now in the background we can see the Reichstag. The Reichstag is where our government is seated. Now we also see the so-called Siegessäule, the, the victory statue, the Victoria. In fact, it used to be very close to the Reichstag. It was moved in 1939 to a different location, roughly 1.6 kilometers away. It used to be located there. Now, actually, the current story is almost in the 1940s. So at this point, the statue should already be moved. But I think we can give it a bit of leaning way. This is a fictional universe anyway. And I mean, the detail is there. It used to be at that place and you could see it together with the Reichstag, depending on your location. Nowadays you can't anymore because it's not there, but uh, it's still a nice detail. So someone did take an interest in it. Now about the statue, maybe the design is of interest because there is a laurel of the victor on the head with an iron cross and there's an eagle sitting atop of this helmet. Very typical for Germany. And actually the statue goes as far back as to Hermann or Arminius, who defeated the Roman Empire in a battle at the Teutoburg Forest. Near the end of the episode, we see a lot of military equipment and I can say it's all accurate. So let's get into it in order of appearance. First off, we have Soviet troops. There are Katyusha rocket launchers, also called Stalin Orgeln, which means Stalin's organs. Then there are soldiers with a PPSH-41 submachine gun, typical and really reliable Soviet machine gun back in the day, submachine gun to be exact. And the artillery there is also typical Soviet artillery. It's the 122 mm gun, it's the M1931 or 37, or also shortened as A19. The tank then destroyed is, of course, the famous T-34. <laughs> the pistols by these dual-wielding Nazi, well, these are very accurate as well. First off, we have a Mauser C-96, which is... Um, you might have seen it already in Resident Evil 4 as the Red 9. And the other one, also very famous from all these World War II movies, is the Luger, or to be more specific, the Luger P08. The artillery here, which seems ginormous, has actually existed. It's the so-called Schwerer Gustav, or the other model, which was named Dora, and it's a railway cannon. And also we see a short scene of the Brandenburg Gate, which is a little bit weird to me because it misses the quadriga, 
the um, chariot figurine on top. Zeke Heil. Another term you have certainly heard quite a few times already, but which has surely been never really properly explained to you. Well, it was a common greeting in the Third Reich, together with Heil Hitler, of course. And Heil was a common greeting in the First Reich in medieval times, just like Hail would be a typical greeting in medieval England. Now, the etymology is related to the words Heilig, which means holy, and Heilen, which means to heal. And in this context, it can imply blessings to be wished upon something. Or may God's grace be blessed upon someone. You know, stuff like that. If you told someone Hail or Heil in medieval times, it basically means may God bless you. So, to explain this a bit further, the first German Reich's official name was the Holy Roman Empire of a German Nation. This was due to a biblical prophecy of a world coming to an end after a number of great empires. And the Roman Empire was considered to be the last one of them. So several Christian empires afterwards claimed to be successors of Rome to prevent this prophecy from coming true. Therefore, up until 1945, Germans considered their country to be a holy country. Even the people who plotted against Hitler, like Stauffenberg, they and the NVN still said they all did this for holy Germany. Furthermore, German soldiers in both world wars would have a motto stitched into their belts. This motto was Gott mit uns, which translates to God with us. Now you may have a proper explanation why all this Heil stuff was always going around. It really uh, draws from a long history in Germany especially. At the end we get a glimpse of the opening. And at the end of this opening there are two interesting sentences. Verweile doch, du bist so schön, das ewig weibliche zieht uns hinan. Now those two quotes are actually from Faust, one of the most famous German books. For now I spare you what the book is about, but maybe when more names are mentioned I will tell you how it may relate to the characters. I already know from looking at certain sites that Reinhardt supposedly has an alias called Mephistoteles, which is the main antagonist or the demon of the book. Now, I don't know exactly what these quotes refer to. I've read the book uh, 10 years ago maybe in school, so I can't really tell from memory. Perhaps why these quotes are chosen may be mentioned later on. So if you like these kind of analysis videos, be sure to subscribe, maybe follow me on Twitter and or on Facebook and share this video with all who might be interested in it. Also check out our Schwarzes Marken analysis video if you're interested in Germany and how well it is represented in that show. Thank you for watching, until the next time. Now in the back we are seeing the Reichstag and uh, whether you know or not, the Reichstag is a building where even today our govern... Uh, mm.